Thank you all of you for being here. I'm gonna give my introduction so you understand where I'm coming from. And then I'm gonna dive into a couple of different things um, today. And really there's sort of two parts of this. I, I, I did create a little bit of a, like a, a Prezi presentation because I was kind of like playing with the tool and trying to organize, organize my thoughts. But ultimately I think one of the biggest things I'm gonna be passing along to you is actually a list of resources, um, which has been the content that I have been most um, sort of, what's the word, like enthralled in over the last, I would say over the last year in some cases, over the last month, most definitely, this month for me personally has been um, conveniently themed all about money. And why I say that is because I personally have come to a point in my life where in order for me to achieve my goals, I need to achieve a transformation around my relationship to money, right? And so I'll sort of explain what that means um, as, we, as we get into this and, and you'll start to understand where some of these resources come from. But for those of you who don't know, you know, I, I, I grew up in Washington State, Pacific Northwest, had the dream of being a professional dancer and actually made my way to the East Coast from the West Coast. Um, went to school for dance, studied choreography with a concentration in performance, um, and was very fortunate enough to dance for a couple of companies, both in the DC area and in the New York City area. While I was in New York, uh, I lived in New York for 10 years, um, I started off as a dancer with my primary source of income um, and <laughs> realized really quickly that you can't pay any bills with the amount of money that they pay dancers in New York City. So I sort of tried to figure out what the path was for me. Like a lot of people, I ended up in the nonprofit sector, specifically in arts management, marketing and communications, which makes sense because I think as artists, our one of our skill sets is expression. And so it just was sort of a natural um, sort of transition for me to learn how to express myself in these other environments um, of like social media and website, et cetera, right? Email newsletters, written copy, et cetera. So I spent about, uh, I would say about two and a half, three years. Hey, Andre, welcome. We're starting the presentation. Well, uh, so we're diving in. Um, so I spent about two and a half, three years in the nonprofit sector and unfortunately ended up poor, even though I was fully employed. And, and I say that because what I acknowledge about the nonprofit sector, um, and I think many of us have, have perhaps experienced this, is that the, um, the wages are just not what we need them to be in order to meet certain living expenses. And again, I was in New York City and, you know, living expenses are a particular bracket of existence, um, you know, and so, and so that was a challenge, right? Uh, so for, fortunately, um, I was introduced to the world of bookkeeping. That's where I met Alex, uh, for example. Um, and, and though that being said, I was actually, uh, I was introduced to the world of bookkeeping through a nonprofit where I'd helped low income and unemployed individuals enter into the workforce as bookkeeping and accounting professionals. So it was all about job training and empowering individuals to understand, for how really empowering these individuals to understand how that knowledge could be used to get a job. But then as I learned about the work, I realized, oh wow, accounting, as some of you might know, is sort of the language, the language of business. So if you can understand the numbers, then you can start to understand how to create the kind of business that you want to create, right? And so I was sort of really, I became in, very interested in numbers um, um, through that work and then jumped over into the for-profit world. My adventures into the for-profit world um, were profound, uh, meaning that I had no background in education in for-profit business, but I dove right in um, and became ultimately a salesperson, a marketing person, a business development person, an HR person. Ultimately, um, and you sort of wore all the hats, if you will, explicitly in the context of a small business. I actually ended up as the CEO of an accounting consulting firm and Emelina was mentioning earlier that I had been speaking at conferences um, and, and explicitly my work in the accounting world was helping um, at the end of the day helping 
leaders of firms understand how to bring technology into their practices in order to optimize and, 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 and sort of develop a strategic approach towards servicing customers and innovating. Basically, I was bringing the, the concept of innovation into small business growth within the accounting sector. And that was awesome, was uh, a great learning experience until the whole thing blew up <laughs> in my face. Um, I found out after seven years of hard work that my business partner had been embezzling millions of dollars from a client and that was where it all disappeared. Um, Alex, you did not know that? <laughs> Got it. Okay, so we have. We if have, I could just add to that, that it happened to be embezzling from an art. The client was an artist, yeah. uh, which I think is kind of relevant because artists tend to get exploited. Yeah, exactly. Especially when it comes to the conversation around money. Exactly. So, so my business partner ended up in jail, and my business got shut down, uh, and I made my way through the chaos of what I would describe as one of the worst case scenarios for being in small business. So, so I, I sort of was describing this to somebody the other day. It's like, I went into the nonprofit sector and ended up poor. I was like, oh shoot, how did that happen? Right. I went into biz, the business sector and got, to be fair, screwed. Right. I was like, okay, great. So I learned a few things the hard way about that experience. But I also learned a lot of really amazing things. I learned a lot more about accounting and finance. I hung out with CPAs and CFOs and tax people and legal people and entrepreneurs left and right. I engaged in a lot of content around um, just around the mindset of being in business and what it meant to grow a business or shrink a business, expand a business, get out there and generate sales, bring that business in and convert it into growth, right? So I have, I have this business background, but meanwhile, I've always been an artist and I was actually um, very fortunate during my time span in New York to make the transition from dancing for other people to dancing for myself as my own company. So I had my own company with a friend. It was amazing. Um, and the first dance concert we produced, which for those of you who know anything about dance, this is going to be a shocker no outside funding, all internally developed or raised funds. We broke even on the first dance concert. Second dance concert, we made money, which is like rare for dance. And so I was really proud of that. It was super exciting to discover a way of being inside of a business model that prior to in the nonprofit sector resulted in not having much, right? So, um, so this is sort of where I'm coming from when I talk about money and when I talk about when I really what I bring to the table when I have this conversation, because what I realized was that the systems that we have in the nonprofit sector aren't designed necessarily to support us from the perspective of thriving, right? There's something to be had in the for-profit sector that works. Now, now this is where I, I, I come to my presentation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually share my screen. Um, and I'll walk you through a couple of things that I think are really critical. And while I'm doing this, um, you know, keep in mind that if you have any questions, we'll, we'll have a little Q&A on the back end. Um, can you see my screen okay, Emelina? Actually, oh, now I can. Got it, okay. Yes. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna walk you through um, just sort of on a high level, and this is gonna be really high level. I'm gonna be hitting things that are, um, you know, the, to be fair, I've been studying for a long time and there's books written about it. There's like a whole lot of studies. So remember, this is like the 30,000, uh, you know, feet view of this topic, right? But really when I think about this topic, I break it down into sort of three, uh, four, four components. There's systems, there's you, there's the art, and then there's the money, okay? And so we're gonna talk about each one of these a little bit more specifically. So when I talk about business systems uh, or systems, what I mean is business is a system for, it, for turning insert object into money, right? So in this example here, business is a system for turning art into money, okay? Now the thing to know about business, as I've learned the hard way, is there's good business and there's bad business, right? Now, now there's a conversation here about capitalism to be had. One of my background, one of my um, 
um, bodies of work, if you will, is in the space of conscious capitalism. And I've done a ton of work in community building around this idea of purpose-driven business. And so I think, I, and I think, you know, I, I hate to beat on this, this horse so hard, but the point is, is I think that one of the biggest hurdles I have with artists is for, first and foremost, they're sort of fundamental dislike for capitalism. And I get it. It sucks when you get taken advantage of by a capitalist structure. But the truth is, and, and there, there's, this is a nuanced statement I understand considering our current president, but the truth is we live in a capitalist machine. We live in a capitalist society. And so part of being in a system is understanding the system that you're inside of, right? So that's really important. Now, whether or not you choose to go against the system, it's a it's a matter of choice and it's a matter of conscious choice that that um that is the distinction that needs to be made and your power to be in that system right then there's a concept of best practices so within that system that we operate in there are best practices if you choose to be a nonprofit. there are best practices if you choose to be a for-profit and these best practices don't mean that you have to do them but it means that there's a benchmark, there's a standard, there's a set of operating principles that can guide you towards success within that system. Again, it's your choice to engage in those practices. And some people are actually more successful by going against the grain. But again, that's something to, to consider inside of the system. The fourth component is the market, right? That your work, the thing that you're making inside of the system exists in a marketplace. And so I think that's really critical to understand because, because when you think about market, uh, you, it's actually it, like a perfect example is what we're dealing with right now. Our entire ecosystem, the markets that we operate in are all going through radical transformation because of COVID. And so because of that, there's a lot of reinvention, but it doesn't mean that the market doesn't exist. It just means that the nature of the market is, drastically shifting and becoming something different and the or the the bodies within that market are shifting their relationship to to what it is that they need for example what's important to them right so your mindfulness and your ability to understand market is critical um not just from like oh i have customers and they are my target market but that those customers exist in an ecosystem and that ecosystem exists in a bigger ecosystem etc right and then within all of that within the system, there are these beliefs and attitudes, right? Beliefs about how business needs to operate, beliefs about what's important to provide to your customers, attitudes about how to treat other people, right? And all of these things are a part of this dialogue that you need to become present to when you acknowledge that you're living in a system, right? And so really what it boils down to from an artistic perspective is what culture are you creating or manifesting within that system? Right. So, uh, so the next thing to understand about the system uh, that we operate inside of, where the goal is to turn art into money, is that is this concept called cash flow quadrants. Now, if I could see you, I would ask you to raise your hand if you've ever read Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Quadrants. If you haven't, um, that is definitely one of the resources that I'm I'm recommending to you. But what you need to understand is that within the system that we operate in, there are really only four ways to make money. Right. The first one is as an employee, which some of you understand, well, most of you will understand. The second one is self-employed, right, or small business. The fourth category is big business, things like franchises, for example, or or businesses that have hundreds, if not thousands of employees in multiple locations. And then there's through the act of investment. Now, the thing to understand is that within each one of these quadrants there's a primary motivation or way of operating that gain that generates the greatest value out of that particular quadrant it has and it has to do with um with your relation ultimately it has to do with your relationship to money so the e quadrant and the s quadrant the employee and the self-employed both exist on one side of a quadrant where the relationship to money is linear you trade time for dollars that's the hourly employee a consultant you trade time for money right it's it's a it's a dollar it's a it's a, a single unit exchange it's it's a, a linear exchange versus the other side of the quadrant the big business side and the investor side where the the income generation is non-linear 
right? You, 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 a dollar today is $5 tomorrow is a hundred dollars. The next day is $500 the next day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, and, and the truth is most people live in the E or the S quadrant, right? The challenge is, is that the opportunity to gen to create freedom for yourself financially exists in the non-linear quadrant. Now, what's really cool, PS, is that technology is giving us the ability to create business models that give us access to some of the B quadrant ways of operating. Um, but the problem is, is that if 90% of the population only know how to operate in a linear model, jumping over to a non-linear model of or relationship to money is, is, is like learning a new language, right? But the important thing for you to understand, and again, I'll, this is a resource that I'll direct you all to, is what are the rules of the game within the quadrant that my business exists in, okay? And I know there's probably gonna be questions on that one, so we'll um, just bookmark them and we'll, go, we'll come back. So then the other thing to understand about business systems, and I think this is really important, is, uh, is that business is a process. It's an organic process. It's about taking an idea and, and, if you choose, creating an organization around it. One of you had brought up, I think it was Sam, you brought up this question about um, strategy on how to move from your corporate job to your full-time job. And the first thing that came to mind was this concept of lean startup, lean startup principles, which is actually a way of creating creating a business that we've learned from the, from the um, SaaS world, from the technology world, right? And, 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 and interestingly enough, it was that same principle, the same process that I leveraged to create the dance company when I was building the dance company. So, so what it boils down to is that there's a, a it, and you can look it up, it's called the Lean Startup Principle, but basically what's important to know from this slide is you got to take a MVP, a minimal minimum viable product into a market, create a system of people and processes around that, that's B quadrant, that's B quadrant thinking right there, monitor the resources, whether it's time, money, or the talent of other human beings, and walk yourself through growth, right? That it's something that happens in stages over time, so your business starts to evolve, okay? So knowing that um, businesses are systems, and in this case, business is a system for turning art into money, the next thing that you need to be present to, and I think this is, um, I, I, this is the one that I'm, I'm really working on right now. Like I get business systems. I really believe um, that I understand sort of what's going on in that world. I'm learning a lot right now on my own mindset. And so really this is the critical thing. It's like how you are here, you know, you know that quote, like how you are in one place is how you are in every place, right? And there's this principle of be, do, have that I think is important as sort of a, an approach towards mindsets. Like if you can be the thing that you want to be internally and do the thing that that, 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 that person or that person with the vision seeks to do, then you will have the things that, that result from doing the actions of being the thing. Right. And that, I know that sounds uh, maybe pretty meta meta, but, but trust me, it's, it's, it's a critical thing to understand. And what it boils down to is mindset. Right. And so when I talk about mindset, um, I, we've probably all done some form of mindset work, but what it boils down to is what stories run your life, right? What legacies are you carrying on through your family? What did society teach you to be, right? And so really, for me personally, I grew up poor. I grew up with a mom who raised three kids and she struggled. So a lot of what I learned about being uh, a person in relationship to money was that it was hard, that, that it was a struggle, that it was difficult. And in fact, living in sort of an industrial age, that my brain was trained to be poor. And so part of my growth opportunity was learning that that wasn't actually the thing that I had to be, right? And, I, and, I, and we all have different stories and things that sort of determine how we understand things and there's sort of that that concept of you don't know what you don't know right which brings us into the next um the next section of the of this particular mindset piece um or the you piece which is knowledge right so whereas there's sort of this internal stuff that needs to occur for you be, to be able to shift your way of being 
in the doing so that you can have the thing that you're trying to create within the systems that you choose to live in and consciously choose to live in. There's also the knowledge that you have going into it, right? And when it comes to business knowledge in particular, marketing, accounting, and leadership are critical, right? Marketing is, is really the engine for generating revenue. So if you're not marketing yourself, if you're not out there talking about your work in the world, then nobody's going to find out about it. And it's not going to generate any opportunity for you, right? My number, my job, the work I do for a lot of my clients is about generating revenue. And that's all boils down to marketing. So you need to understand for yourself, for your creative practice, um, that marketing is a skill set, just like being a ballet dancer. There's a beginner level, a middle level, an expert level. And it's your job to understand that that, that is the case. And, and granted, you don't need to know everything. Um, you can't know everything. Um, but, but recognize that there's always more to learn. The same thing is the case with accounting, right? It's a, it's a system. It's about understanding the, on, sort of on a basic level the principles, principles of bookkeeping. And then from there, understanding that you have a relationship to a tax, a body that taxes you. But then as you begin to, to, to gain a sophistication around the numbers, you start to understand, well, actually, there is something to be said about having debt, right? A lot of us think that debt is bad. Well, it's bad if you don't know how to use it, right? And then like, let's be clear, because the, the, the structures that we live inside of, um, if you know how to leverage debt to climb through that economic system, you could be making much greater work for people. And a good example of that, I think, is real estate, right? If you know how to get yourself into the real estate game so that you can create space for creativity to thrive inside of property, that creates so much potential that you would, I know, for example, you, me, me and you, Emily, you know, we, if we had only had a space, oh my God, the things we could have done in New York City would have been crazy, right? Okay, and the last thing, and I think this is, I would say this is the most important thing, is if you are an artist who wants to make money inside of a business system, you have to understand that you need to be a leader, a leader for yourself, a leader for your organization, a leader for your community, a leader for the people that you're choosing to give your work to. And even that alone is something that can take you your entire lifetime to refine, to perfect, to develop. And again, I remind you, you don't know what you don't know. So part of being an effective leader in this ecosystem as it relates to knowledge is finding people to work with who can support you and offset what it is that you do. And that brings us to the thing that you do, right? Art is an object of human expression. And this is my definition. Um, I'm sure other people have other definitions, but I think it's important to identify that it is an object because that means it's something I can put up for sale in a marketplace, right? Now, the thing to understand is that within a marketplace, there's the vehicle or the form that it takes, a play, a dance, a painting, an experience, a song, right? What are the questions of what are you making, right? But the thing that, well, and there's like a whole conversation about about expanding your definition of what you can make because what i've discovered is that an artist really for me an artist is a way of being i consider all of the businesses that i work on to be frankly art projects they're they're some of my biggest most complicated um, um art objects but 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 there is a creativity to the craft of creating anything right and then ultimately there's a destination or an impact to that thing that you're creating and the question you need to ask yourself is to what value uh do people experience your work right because i there's this thing that about oh well, i'm making my art and i'm putting it online why am i not making any money well, there's a hundred reasons why you're probably not making money just by putting your art online. But one of the reasons you're probably not making money by putting your art online is because there's nobody who's, there's no market there to receive it. And if they see it and they receive it, do they understand the value? Does it have an impression on them? Are you actually bringing the kind of people that need to experience your work into the room? Who needs to experience your work? These are all, by the way, business questions, strategic business questions um, that we would ask if we were building a business plan, right? And so the last thing I say, I was gonna say the Benjamins, the Benjawomans, right? Yeah, because I feel like we are in this really interesting um, dynamic right now where there's like the need for feminine energy to be present in business, to be present in life. I mean, like, that's what it is. So I'm going to change the language. But what it boils down to with the numbers, it's like the numbers 
it, what it boils down to is you got to know your numbers. You got to not be afraid of them. I know several of you said that you were ignoring them or you didn't talk about them and that's okay. So fine. What I do and what has worked with me is having accountability buddies. Like once a week we get together and we talk about our numbers and it's awkward and it's weird. And we talk about our bills and we talk about what we're not paying or, or, or what's coming down the pipeline, but it's a practice in getting to know your numbers. And as you get to know them, you can begin to understand how important it is to ask for what you're worth, right? Asking for what you're worth ties back to the mindset piece um, in part, right? And I think there's a lot of, if you, for example, in my case, grew up poor, there's a lot of work to be done around elevating your, your self-worth and really being confident in asking uh, uh, for what you're worth and, and therefore asking for the value of the work that you create into the world. And then from that, you create cash flow. From revenue, you create cash flow. And then it just becomes a matter of managing that cash flow. And as money starts to flow in, it becomes a game of forecasting, 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 looking into the future and, and seeing what you can create uh, based on leveraged income. So let me just check the time. I think I have a really, I'm gonna do a quick run through on some of the resources. How, uh, give me like three minutes, Emelina, is that cool? Okay, cool. So wave your hand when I'm at three minutes and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Cause I'll send all of these for, uh, as links to you all. But if there was one resource that I, that I would encourage all of you to study because it is such a different way of thinking about money. And I've done a lot of research on different ways. It's the Millionaire Master Plan by Roger James Hamilton. The reason why I love this thing is because two reasons. One, there's a whole assessment tool where it basically incur it basically creates an opportunity for you to understand how your genius your it's it's a wealth genius profile it's like if your desire is to generate wealth for yourself here is the genius profile that is going to allow allow for you to do that my genius profile is as a dynamo which makes sense that's why i'm a performer that's why i get up on stage that's why i'm i'm energetic and inspired but then within each persona there's a, a certain progression of your engagement towards the flow of money in the ecosystem of the, 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 the system that we're inside of. And what, I, what many of us, and I won't define it, but many of us are stuck at infrared, red, or what he calls infrared, red, or orange level. Orange level is the person that has the nine to five, but never seems to quite pay all their bills, or maybe can afford to go on vacation every now and then, but they're still struggling. Most people, do not, a lot of people do not break past orange level and scale up into the levels of enterprise where, where massive wealth becomes more about philanthropy and contribution to society. Definitely check out that plan. Really quickly, some of these other ones, um, how to escape poverty. That one is super powerful by this guy, Douglas Kruger. What that one boils down to, again, is self-worth. If you're not valuing yourself, other people are not going to value you. And if you can't elevate your self-worth, then it's going to be a very difficult path um, to be on if your desire is to generate revenue. And you can escape poverty. There is a path towards it. And watching people like, well, this, this video here, Warren Buffett, talk to Bill Gates, talk, like watching the two of them interact. Yeah, fine, maybe these aren't your favorite billionaires, right? Look at Oprah, look at, look at whoever else you want. But there is something important to be said about studying the people who have figured it out. I think one of the traps that we get caught into on the nonprofit side is we get so caught up in the poverty mindset, we start to study it, start to analyze it, and the value of studying how to be poor versus the value of how to studying how to be rich is two different, um, uh, it generates two different mindsets, right? I mentioned the cash flow quadrants. I think you should check that out. Really understanding where you're at in the cash flow quadrants is critical to understanding how to leverage the system that you're inside of. And and my favorite book, I think my favorite book, and this is the one, because this is the one that brings, um, brings hope, prosperity, inspiration to the conversation of money is The Soul of Money, Transforming Your Relationships with Money and Life by Lynn Twist. And the reason why I love that book, just in summation, is because, and this 
is spoken about in the Millionaire Master Plan too, because there's a relationship to flow and money that needs to be um, identified and based on what phase you're at and your genius profile, the way you approach flow is different. But what the soul of money acknowledges is that there is actually a flow to money. And part of the challenge that we have as, as artists, as creators, as people who get taught to believe that there's a limited resource, we get taught to get caught and hold on to it, right? But actually the challenge is to let that money flow through you and into the into and through to the ecosystem um, because you are participating in a much bigger picture, much bigger conversation. And so that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and so I'm gonna um, maybe shut up and uh, let uh, you, Emelina, facilitate the Q&A. <laughs>